Good morning, Tahoe Community Church. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that I am, I, I've become at a certain age that I'm well aware that I don't know what's cool anymore. Um, I don't know, like I don't know what music is good or whatever, and, and you know, we all have to accept that and hopefully, hopefully we grace. Um, so right now we're gonna start this, uh, this service with a song called, Are You Washed in the Blood? And this song wasn't cool like 40 years ago. And so, um, but, but I'd like for everybody as they're listening to this song, as they're singing this song, um, this is one of the most powerful lyrics. These are some of the most powerful lyrics. If you listen to them and you apply them, they can change your life over any trouble you have. This song can be answered. It's amazing. So please rise and see, are you washed in the blood? Community Church, how are we doing? All right, good to have you all here. Hey, so uh, this is Sunday morning, and this is uh, time we gather to give God glory and worship. Um, I see a lot of visitors in town joining us. I'm glad you guys found us. God bless you all, and uh, we'll, we'll be praying for your adventure here. Hope you have a, a really good time visiting us here in Lake Tahoe. Um, a lot going on. We got a vacation Bible school at the, the end of the uh, the month here coming up. And we have a thing, it's pretty modern, it's pretty hip, it's called clipboard technology. Right there it is. <laughs> Let me explain how this works. It's going to go down like this, it's going to do a 180, down here, nail another 180, go back this way, it's going to do a fakie there, back this way. It's going to go back and forth like this, then someone's going to cross the big chasm here, the neighbors, and then bring it to this side, and it's going to go... And it's going to be thrown up here. Got it? On this is different needs for food and uh, for, I think, probably for the games too. I think it's probably made of food. Yeah, we're going to call this food. But so put your name uh, next to this if you can uh, donate that food to us. Is that okay? And the food is all going to be congregated up in the office. All right? Okay. Very good. And other than that, we've got uh, uh, same old, same old going on this week. Fantastic Bible story, uh, Bible study Wednesday mornings at 8. 
in the morning in, a, in the fellowship hall right across here. So please join us for that. We're going through um, Erwin Lutzer's book, which is named <laughs> No Reason to Hide. No Reason to Hide. That's right. There is no reason to hide. It really encourages us to be bolder and get our voice back. The, the church has been told to shut up for, for decades now, and uh, this is a charge for us to, uh, to speak up and uh, uh, stand our ground. That's a really interesting principle in Scripture about standing our ground, right? Not losing ground, right? Uh, stand in the gap. Uh, be a watchman on the wall. All of these principles are going to be uh, studied on Wednesday morning. So please join us. We, have, we, we do a breakfast at that time, too, so it's an awesome time. Uh, with that said, um, let me go ahead and, and uh, open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, above, I just praise you and thank you so much, Lord God, for your provision, how you take care of this body, Lord God. Um, one day at a time, we, we carry on, Lord God. I pray that you continue to encourage the uh, search committee as we're looking for a new pastor. Pray, Lord God, that you... Uh, Give them energy and equip them, Lord God, and encourage them, Lord God, and encourage our whole body to uh, persevere, Lord God. But in the meantime, Lord God, our, our bodies, um, just uh, one day at a time, we're, we're serving each other, we're loving each other, we're teaching each other, we're, we're growing in different aspects, Lord God. So it's just been awesome to see that uh, as a body of believers under you, with, uh, with just a, a heart to, to follow and obey, Lord God, we've seen uh, much happen in this body of believers, Lord God. So I thank you and praise you, Lord God, and give you glory that uh, even though we don't have a shepherd at this time, you certainly haven't abandoned us, and you truly are the good shepherd, Lord God. We praise you for that and give you uh, praise, honor, glory, Lord God, for that position. It's exciting to be just directly under you, Lord God, as we seek your will. Uh, one day at a time for this body of believers, Lord God. So I thank you and praise you, Lord God. In your precious Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we've got a little uh, little uh, recognition here. Um, we're willing to have uh, Jackie Daly come up, and uh, she's going to take it away. Good morning. Hi. So um, we have a lady here today, Kate Warner. And I'd like to uh, have her come up here, please, in appreciation of, um, she has been doing Sunday school for many, many years. And uh, we'd like to present her with a uh, thank you. So I'm going to give you a hug. And I just want to read to you. This is our Sunday school, uh, from our Sunday school handbook. And it's in uh, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And that's in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Now, Kate, uh, that's, that's you. You know, that's, that is really you. And um, that you would think that it's just for the fact for the, uh, your own children, but it's not. It's for the church family. It's for the church family. That's for, this is a, a command for, for, this is for all of us. So um, I want you to know that Kate is intentional, and that's what that Bible verse is all about. And Kate is very intentional. Uh, she is compassionate, she is generous, she is reliable, always been reliable, uh, willing, her willingness to serve this body and these children and this community. She's mellow, I love that, <laughs> uh, easy going, easy to work with, joyful, kind, loving, and willingness to step out, uh, out of her comfort zone. So Kate, told me, no, I don't really do little kids. And, uh, <laughs> I like the big kids. I like the bigger kids, right? And I said, oh, well, I think you can do it. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, she started teaching the little kids and the big kids, and most every Sunday, which is reliable, just turned up most every Sunday to take care of our, our, our younger children. So 
Anyways, let's let's give Kate some more appreciation. <laughs> really hard to compete uh, for church time with all the other activities and stuff that you know school and sports and everything provide for our kids but my mom and my grandmothers always drug me to church <laughs> always and um, I drifted away in my 20s I drifted away and those seeds get planted they get planted deep so even though it's hard and you get frustrated, <laughs> I'm sure, just hang in there and just keep bringing them because they're listening and they are amazing. They're learning so quickly. I was shocked and it's just, it was so fun. And those of you who are a little scared about volunteering to teach, it's fun. You get, you get much more out of it. There's two of them. <laughs> you get much more out of it than, than you actually are putting into it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for all those years of service. God bless you. Okay, now we have uh, a crew testimony. Uh, testimony. Emma, could you come forward and tell us a little bit about the story? We have a crew here all summer long. We've got quite a few of them this year, and uh, we do testimonies. Here you go. Hi, uh, my name's Emma. Um, so, yeah, I didn't grow up knowing Jesus. Um, I used to go to church with my family every Sunday. Go to Sunday school, all the things. Um, but that's as far as like I went. You know, I was coloring in the pews, not really paying attention. Um, and then middle school was when my parents got divorced, so that's when we stopped going to church. Um, so I didn't really know anything besides that there was a God, um, and that's as far as it went. Um, and yeah, that kind of just led to a life of just people pleasing, um, just caring about what people thought of me. Um, so I would do anything that I could just to fit in with the crowd. Um, I would just say yes to everything that was asked of me. Uh, I was just kind of known as someone else's friend. It wasn't really like, oh, like, that's Emma. It was like, oh, no, you're so-and-so's friend. Um, it's that kind of thing. Um, I tried just the party scene, just thought that was kind of what everyone was doing. Um, I would just crave approval from my friends and from boys and all things like that. Um, and all of that just left me very empty, anxious, sad, isolated, and disappointed. Um, and growing up, a lot of lies that I believed was just that I was only loved for um, what people could get out of me, what I could give, um, that I just wasn't enough for people, that I just was unlovable. Um, when I started college, I started to feel like a longing in my heart for something. I just, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I knew something was missing. Um, so going into my sophomore year, that was when COVID hit. And um, that's when I just like, I felt like I needed to read the Bible. I didn't know why. I just like, that's just something that I kept repeating. So um, yeah, my best friend was like a huge blessing in that. She showed me the new version Bible app, and that's how I started reading the Bible, getting in the Word, and just learning about the gospel, learning who Jesus was. Um, so with that, though, I was still living a pretty double life, um, just doing my own thing, just trying to seek what I wanted, what filled me. Um, but it still wasn't working. And I kind of started realizing that going into my junior year that summer, um, I met someone that I met a guy that like I wasn't making the best decisions with, and I knew that, and um, it was it left me in a lot of shame, a lot of um, hurt, a lot of just um, guilt because I knew what I was doing was wrong, and I knew that God had something better for me. But at the time, like I just didn't care because I was still longing for just wanting to be wanted and just like wanting that attention, but just looking for it in the wrong places. Um, and then just before school started, I just like was sitting in the room and I was just like crying like I just felt so numb so lost so empty um and then that was like the first time where I like, really felt God's love and his grace cover me um and I just felt like that shame and that guilt like lift off my shoulders um and it was like that was like relieving feeling ever um so going back to school my junior year of college I just realized like I wanted to think like I didn't want to live this life anymore um and then that's when I started going to church again. And then that's when I actually started getting involved in crew at my school. And that was where everything like catapulted for me. Um, I just was blessed with an amazing community who loved me for who I was. And um, yeah, that they just cared about me. They cared about my relationship with the Lord. And that's like when my relationship with God started to actually like become real to me. Um, and yeah, since then, it's just been amazing. I've just been learning a lot of just like, Loving, loving the way that God created me and um, 
yeah, just knowing how to place my identity in him and just believing what he says about me and who I am rather than caring about other people's opinions, caring about what I thought other people thought of me. Um, and yeah, I think a verse that really just, um, I wanted to leave with that really encouraged me and just kind of helped me come out of that mindset of like people pleasing and all that. Um, it's Romans 12 too. Um, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Um, that, by testing you may, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, thank you for listening. really powerful and it means a lot more than you might think to everybody here. So thank you very much for that. Yeah.
It's a nice, cool old church word. Uh, there on the windowsill or in the back there, there is a basket, a basket that uh, we would love to see um, $100 bills and 20 and whatever, whatever pocket change we have just dumped in there. Um, God's provided for us. Enough kidding aside, God has taken care of us. It's been awesome. But that's how we do our offering. You can just leave it on your way out. And it's this time that we're going to go ahead and give God thanks for the offering. We also have a thing called... Uh, a website on this thing called the Interweb. Maybe you've heard of that. And TalkCommunity.org if you want to give there also. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we continue to just praise you and give your glory, Lord God, for uh, for what you've uh, continued to do in this body of believers here, Lord God. We faithfully uh, meet on the hill here to uh, expand your glory, expand your kingdom, Lord God. But uh, we just uh, continue to be used by you, Lord God. We see through uh, your word, Lord God, that uh, you chose 
to spread the gospel through people who believe you and have been uh, not only converts, we have become your disciples and followers, Lord God. So you preordain the, the spreading of your, your good news by using us, the church, Lord God. And so that responsibility is, is weighs heavy on us, Lord God. And we, we thank you, Lord God, that you continue to provide for us uh, uh, one day at a time. Lord God, as we trust you, Lord God, we, uh, we just ask that you uh, uh, continue to bless uh, us with uh, the uh, provision we need to manage and run this, this church, Lord God. In your precious son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. And now we've got another true testimony from Joan. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's dismiss the kids. We've got some kids going into uh, kids' church. Paula and Jackie out there. And they'll get uh, some Bible teaching. Awesome. And Joan, if you want to come forward and uh, share your testimony. Crew is a, a, a summer ministry. It's a college ministry. And, of course, they're here taking on jobs in the community, and they also then uh, spend their time sharing the gospel and making relationships. So that's what they're here doing. God bless you. Here you go. Thanks, Joan. Hello. My Hello. name is actually Joanne. <laughs> 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 um, so I grew up going to church so, at a really young age, and um, I don't know, uh, we, my family grew up and like we went to this very interesting church, but I don't know, we eventually left the church because they just, I don't know, they, they kind of hurt a lot of the people in the church and so I didn't really get much background on it besides the wrong idea of who God really was. Um, so that so that meant I really didn't grow up a lot of like knowing who God was. Um, but like, so I had no guidance on like, like from my family at all to like be encouraged and learn who God was. I know that my mom did have some background on knowing God, but never did I have like someone to look up to and learn from. Um, so uh, that just was really hard, especially going into like my teenage years. Like a, a lot of things just kind of happened. My parents divorced. My dad almost kind of passed away. He was like in a two month coma and that was shocking. I couldn't see him. So that kind of, and like being the oldest from my family, it like didn't make it hard because I was trying to keep it together and like just be strong and have, and I had no one to like really like run to in times of like a need um, and stuff like that. So it just re became really hard. And I'm, I mean, because so much was going on, like um, I have, I would run to things to like numb out and avoid everything that was going on at home, and I don't know, it became really like hard to keep it like together and like be there for my two sisters and be there for my two parents that were trying to figure out um, this divorce and like I don't know, like heal from that. I was like, I felt like I was in the middle all the time. Um, so that became, it became easier to find ways to know how and avoid those type of situations by, I would say, sinning. Like, I mean, there's so much sin that just kind of like evolved from trying to avoid everything that was going on. Um, um, and this thing I never felt convicted over because during that time I started being introduced about God, but not in the best way. I think my best friend, like it was so interesting growing up, I only had Christian friends. So I, I feel like God was somehow like still like protecting me in some sense because I feel like if I would have found other people that weren't in the right like headspace and like doing things that weren't right, I probably would have kind of followed that. Um, but I started learning about who God was. I wouldn't say that I have the best idea of who God was, especially growing up. I was frustrated, angry, and like I basically at God, I was mad at God. I was frustrated. I was like, why is everything just happening? So it just made it easier. It's like if He's 
not doing much for me, then it's like I can continue to sin and I can continue to do these things because he's already angry at me. So it doesn't matter. Like I think that was what, well, I remember being my mindset then, especially with like growing up with, like with the church that just hurt my family and it's like all these things are just happening. So I'm frustrated um, um, and stuff like that. Um, so this kind of happened like all the like my mindset was kind of like this throughout middle school high school and almost like the beginning of college like covid year was obviously hard for a lot of people and it was extremely hard for me um i think it changed who i was as a person i was much more of a social butterfly and that was kind of like ripped away from me as soon as covid year kind of just came in suffered with a lot of anxieties depression i was now faced with the fact that I had to be at home and like know what's actually going on, see my parents' support, see everything up to my face, and not be like not being able to like run and go to school and like ignore it kind of. Um, so that was really hard. But leading into like my first year of like college, I was approached by this woman and. I'm so thankful for her, like being obedient to God, because if I didn't know who, or had a slight idea of who God was, or had some good type of fear of God, I don't know, there's a good fear, I feel like, of knowing God. Um, she was just obedient, and she ran up to me, and she told me, I felt this need to tell you, and God told me to turn around and tell you, and to invite you to this thing, and I don't know, like, <laughs> This is random lady, like who like pays attention to a random lady? It's just like come and join me at a park and like let's hang out. Like that's kind of scary. So I was like, I don't know if I want to go with her. Um, but I I listened. I was very anxious that day, so I did not leave my room all day till that time because I was like hungry. I was like scared just being in my dorm. Um, it was my freshman year. I was alone, like ten hours away from home. So that was very just shocking, but. I, for some reason, went to this thing that she invited me to, which was still, again, I was scared, like, I don't know. Um, but I, I went, met people, and even as I was anxious and scared, I still pushed myself to go. And if I never have, like, had, like, if I just didn't have that good fear, I don't think that I would have had my relationship with God because it all started since that day, like getting to know like these people and like how welcoming they were, like I think was the most beautiful thing because you see God through them immediately. Um, but just, yeah, um, it, it, it would have been like such a different turnout, especially since like the school that we go to is such a party school and like the first day I got there, I could have chosen otherwise. Um, but other than that, like I was able to find community. I now have a relationship with God. I wouldn't say that I still don't struggle with my anxieties and like even from a lot of the things that I've gone through. But God has just like kind of eased a lot of that and he's constantly working in my life. And I really love the community of friends that I like made because I don't know, they, they're just amazing. And yeah. I'm not here in mission, so there's clearly like a need to tell people of how amazing God is. Like on the beaches, like there's that urge to tell them how like freeing it is to like welcome him, welcome him in your life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Diana. Right, it's time for Nick Stewart, who's a, a guest uh, a preacher today, to come and give us the word. Come on up, Nick. Just putting this 
cable in the back so I don't, it doesn't bother me here. And uh, if you don't mind me, I'm gonna put on a little chapstick too so I don't smack my lips the whole time, okay? <laughs> you guys will appreciate that. <laughs> All right, you know what? There is probably not enough notes to go around. So um, just as a heads up, there, there were notes in the bulletin and uh, if you didn't get those, maybe see if someone next to you has one that you can kind of share because we are gonna be using that today. There's no fill in the blanks or anything. If you're someone that likes to take notes, I have made some space in there so that you can kind of fill it out and take some notes. Uh, but there are some verses that I won't have up here that uh, might be helpful for you to see. And so I just wanna make sure that you guys are all aware of that. So, uh, you know, before, before we get into the message today, let's just stop and thank God for, um, you know, the testimony of, of Joanne. Uh, and what was the other, what was the other one? There she is. Say the name again. Emma. 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 Uh, thank God just for, for how God's been at work in your life and just that God would speak and teach us this morning. So, Heavenly Father, thank you. For the opportunity to get to share uh, what you've been teaching me this week, the things that you put on my heart to share and teach on. And uh, thank you, Lord, uh, especially how you're alive and at work uh, and in everyone's life. And, and some of us are seeing that more than others and just really encouraged to hear Emma and Joanne and how um, they are becoming more aware of your goodness in their life and the gift of your presence with them. And so I want to ask and invite you this morning to teach us, to challenge us with your word, uh, shape us to be people that love you and that love others, and do it all for, for your name, for your glory. Thanks, Lord. May the words of my mouth and meditations uh, of our hearts be pleasing to you, our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer. Amen. All right, so today we're going to look at the letter of Colossians, and I have a little bit of that printed in your notes, but we're looking at a, a bigger section, and uh, we are going to talk about glory, all right? Um, so everything in life is for God's glory, and I want to do a little exercise here with you. So this is like a like give and response here, okay? So I want feedback, all right? So don't be quiet. Uh, don't shy from this. So tell me what comes to mind when I say the word glory. Just shout, shout answers out. When I say the word glory, what comes to mind? God. 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 Attention. Attention, Jesus. Light. Light and his goodness. His goodness. Beauty. Beauty. Love. Love. There's another one over here. Brilliance. Brilliance. Undeserved. Undeserved. Did I hear that right? Undeserved? Okay. Is there another one? Power. Power. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. This is good. That's. Uh, I was kind of curious what we were gonna get, and that's that's good. So uh, I'm gonna look, name a few different events uh, or things, and, and I want you to tell me if you would consider those to be glorious things or events. Okay. Uh, the birth of Jesus. Yes. yes. Okay. His baptism. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The empty tomb. The resurrection? Yeah. Okay, what about meeting a celebrity? <laughs> no? No? Okay. How about San Francisco Giants winning the World Series? No Giants fans, huh? Bummer. Wow. Definitely a glorious moment in my book. Man. <laughs> How about a, uh, a sunset over Lake Tahoe? Oh, so that does qualify. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, what about the birth of a son or a daughter? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? Consensus on that? Okay. Interesting. Okay, good, 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 good. So I'm not asking to actually know the answer, but just to kind of get us thinking about how we view glory in different settings, okay? So uh, Matthew Bates, probably you guys have never heard of him, and that's okay, uh, but he wrote a book recently called Why the Gospel that I've been reading, and uh, it is uh, it's phenomenal, it's challenging, uh, but he elaborates on glory this way. And I have the quote up here. It says like this. 
Consider glory. When we're speaking Christianese to one another, Christianese just being kind of the language in the church that you get comfortable talking about that people outside the church don't really understand. Okay? When we're speaking Christianese to one another, then glory evokes certain images. Heaven, overwhelming light, a chorus of angels, brightness, radiance, splendor, beauty, final victory, white wings, and golden crowns. Some of you guys listen to those. The Greek word doxa, which is usually translated glory in our Bibles, has some of these associations in the New Testament. But if you were to crack open the leading Greek dictionary that covers the New Testament and its world, you would discover that doxa pertains to greatness, fame, recognition, renown, honor, and prestige. In the New Testament, Glory means not so much heavenly brightness, but fame. The same is true for glory in the Old Testament, in which the word kabod, I think that's just the English spelling of it, that's not how you would actually spell it, but for our, our language it makes sense. Kabod intimates weightiness. We sense a weight of presence, heft, greatness, cloud, when we are near a well-known person. So, kabod ordinarily means fame in the Old Testament too. It's interesting to think about that, uh, because of what Jesus accomplished, we can say then that all of life is for his glory. It's also for his fame, his greatness, his honor, his reputation. The letter of Colossians was written to focus that church to live for the glory of the King Jesus, to make Jesus famous. So, a little bit of background on this letter here. It's a small little letter, um, four chapters. Paul, who wrote the letter, never met this church. <coughs> Did not know these people. They were a church that had started in the town of Colossae. And I'll, I'll put up a map in just a little bit up there, which is modern-day Turkey. Okay? Southwest Turkey. And it all started from the work of Paul's good friend, um, Epaphras. And he was given Paul... Sorry. Paul and him are now in prison, most likely in Rome, and um, Epaphras is giving an update to Paul about the church and how it's doing. Um, but not just how it's doing, um, the challenges that they are experiencing as a community. And one of the biggest threats to this church at the time is the, the pressure from most likely the Jewish people. Uh, the only, we have a couple clues of that in, in the letter itself. It's called a philosophy. Um, but it's probably the Jewish people there. And if you can imagine, here's a, here's a church, people, Gentiles, some Jewish as well, excited about Jesus. Um, now, their text that they're using and going off of is uh, not the New Testament, because they don't have those. Um, they're going off of a lot of the Old Testament at the time. And so you can imagine that would be a pretty serious threat to the Jewish people, who also study the Old Testament, right? And meet to recognize Yahweh as the one true God. Oh, interesting, because here is this new church that is also worshiping the one true God. So, definitely a threat. And, and these Jewish people are arguing that Jesus is not enough to be a part of God's chosen people. There are necessary rites and rituals to be practiced. Therefore, undermining that significance of the King Jesus, as well as deflating the new hope of this church. So Paul um, directs his attention to encourage the church with a picture of who Jesus really is. Okay, so real quick, just uh, fun to kind of get a view here. Uh, will someone point out to me where, where Colossae is in this picture? <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that's pretty, I, you know what, as someone who loves the mountains, I, when I saw this, I was like, wow, that's a beautiful place. I would love to go there. Um, Colossae is actually this little mound right here. <laughs> All right, it was destroyed by an earthquake between 100 and 200 AD, and so it's actually a town that, as of I think the end of 2021, maybe 2022, they just started archaeological digs. So uh, it's, it's fascinating that there are places in the world that probably hold secrets. And, and valuable insights that we have not even discovered. And so I, I love the fact that uh, we get a letter about this, this from this church 
has totally just destroyed and gone, covered up right now. So uh, if you ever get to Turkey and you want to see it, hopefully in future years they'll have more uncovered that you can see. Now, here's a, just a quick little map. Like I said, Southwest Turkey there. And uh, there's Colossae circled um, on the map. It falls in what's called the Lycus Valley. That red line that kind of comes from above, comes down, and it kind of hits this town called Laodicea. Laodicea, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, it's kind of in the same geographic region. Uh, you can see Ephesus on the far side, which is uh, the town that we have the letter to Ephesians from. So just, it's, it's always helpful to kind of get an idea of where are these all located. Now, let's, let's look at Colossians 1, verse 15. Like I said, it's in your notes, um, or you can follow along in your Bible. So, he is the image of God, the invisible one, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things were created in the heavens and here on earth. Things we can see and things we cannot. Thrones and lordships and rulers and powers. All things were created both through him and for him. And he is ahead prior to all else. And in him, all things hold together. And he himself is supreme. The head over the body, the church. He is the start of it all. Firstborn from realms of the dead. So in all things, he might be the chief. For in him all the fullness was glad to dwell, and through him to reconcile all to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, yes, things on the earth and also the things in the heavens. Wow, what a picture. So this is actually, uh, it's been something that's been debated in uh, biblical scholarship for a long time. Uh, where Paul got this. Some people think that um, this, this was written before Paul, um, and he actually just adopted it. Um, but I think there's good credit that, that Paul wrote that wrote this. Um, it probably something that was memorized. In fact, it was probably like something like a song, something that was, when you read it, it's very poetic. We lose the total poetry, beautiful organization of that. Uh, but even just in like the imagery that it displays, there's a sense of it's not just like a letter. There's something beautiful that is describing here. Um, and so you want to talk about elevating the view of Jesus to this church, right? Um, let's, let's focus on Jesus and who he is. It's really similar to what the beginning of the Gospel of John says. In, uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Now the word became flesh and took up residence among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth who came from the Father. Again, here we see what's happening is, is this picture that Jesus is not just man, but there's something bigger about who he is, right? Uh, that there are some powerful statements happening here, that Jesus is the God of creation, the God who is all-knowing and all-powerful, and all of that is dwelling in Jesus as a real, physical, human being. Paul goes on to not only encourage them, we're going to come back to this, these, these five verses um, a little bit later, but Paul goes on to not only encourage them um, with that statement to kind of like fix their minds on that, um, but he also reminds them of where they came from um, and where to keep their focus. So in verse 21, he says, so what about you? Well, there was a time when you were excluded. You were enemies in your thinking and in wicked behavior. But now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to bring you into his presence, holy, blameless, and without any accusation. This assumes, of course, that you keep firmly on in the faith, by which I mean solid on your foundations and not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you heard. This gospel, after all, has been announced in all creation under heaven. And this is the gospel of which I, Paul, became a servant. I think there's this picture of uh, Paul saying, all right, look, Colossians, before you encountered the good news about the King Jesus, you were living completely for yourself. Remember that. You were, you were totally against God. You were against Yahweh, the one true God. Now, have any of you ever found yourself fully consumed with the next achievement, but never fully satisfied, living, living for your own success, your own achievement? Um, or maybe another relationship breaks apart and you're left feeling empty. Or another loss in your portfolio. 
that keeps you anxiously watching the market for a rebound, all of that is focused on, on yourself. That's, that's what life without Jesus is like. And the more you pursue life without God and living for yourself, your thinking and behavior will show that. And it's interesting. I think we start to think of, well, I'm not really that wicked. I'm not really that evil. Um, but as, as it keeps going, I really appreciate what Joanne shared. Um, you get to a place of, of emptiness. You get to a place of extreme anxiety and worry about your life. Because of Jesus, though, um, you can not only be back in good standing with God, you get to be a part of his family. And that's, that's what Paul is trying to remind this church here about, that you're a part of the family now. You are welcomed into his presence where the longings of your heart are fully satisfied in your acceptance with God. That's what the good news is all about. God bringing his enemies into a right relationship with himself. And so Paul is, is really encouraging the Colossians here to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, not the demands of the other philosophies at the time, right? Or the pressure from them, as well as I think there's some shame that's connected there, that they're not good enough to be a part of God's family says, don't, don't fix your eyes on those things. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Remember that he is fully God and fully man. He is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the Savior that God's people have been waiting for. Don't, don't get like, like run off course of that, right? So now um, let's, let's get back here to the, the passage in verse 24. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And I fill up in my physical body, for the sake of his body, the church, what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. I became a servant of the church, according to the stewardship from God, given to me for you, in order to complete the word of God. That is the mystery that has been kept hidden from ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known to them the glorious riches of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him by instructing and teaching all people with all wisdom, so that we may present every person mature in Christ. Toward this goal I also labor, struggling according to his power that powerfully works in me. All right, so what is the gospel that Paul is proclaiming here? All right, this, this is uh, just kind of like taking a little snapshot here. What is this gospel that he is talking about? Well, the first, first thing that we can see, you can see it in verse 24 and 27 and 28, okay? He, he says, Jesus is the Christ. And this is really important to recognize. This is what Matthew Bates has been helping me um, understand a lot more of. This, this, is not, this is not a name. Christ is not, is not a name. Uh, it's not his last name. Um, it's, it's his title. And, and the title is meaning Jesus is King, which makes it makes a lot of sense when you start thinking about um, like the Sermon on the Mount or other teachings of Jesus, especially the parables. What does Jesus say over and over and over? Um, he spends his time talking about the kingdom of God. And, and another picture of this, um, there's there's a lot of examples that you can go to. But another picture of this is is when he ascends. What is he ascending to? He's, a, he's ascending to glory. He's ascending to the right hand of God. Yeah, he's ascending to his, his rightful throne. And just like any king, we, we, we don't like kings because we live in America, right? Uh, right? We, we laugh at Fourth of July because it's like, wait, we're, we, we don't have kings and queens anymore. Like, we, like it's our independence, right? Um, but when you start understanding, like, king language and kingdom language and royal language, you start to pick it up and how this actually lays out in, um, in who Jesus is in his life and the big events that happen there. Because in this ascension, it's this royal enthronement that's taking place, right? So uh, 
And then he not only goes and sits on that throne, but he also promises to return, right? And, and as the king, he can do what? He, he's going to reign over all creation. And, and as the king that he is, not just reigning, but he will bring his truth, his leadership, and his justice. And only the king can do that. So he is the long-awaited king. And that's what Jesus, when you think about this, uh, this would actually be incredibly uh, subversive to the Roman Empire. Uh, so again, this church in Colossae is, is a part of the Roman Empire at large, right? And, and the spread of the good news, this proclamation about Jesus being the king, well, no wonder Paul is in prison. Because he's heralding this news about Jesus being the king. Of course they would be worried about that. Now, the other thing that is important, this, this really captures in verses 15 to 20, is that um, Jesus is supreme, not Caesar. Okay? And you can see that um, kind of laid out there. If you want to circle or highlight on your notes, you can do that, because I think it might be helpful. But a, a few of those ways that we see that he is supreme. It says, in him all things were created. In him all things are held together. That he is before all things. It says he is supreme. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Again, talk about elevating Jesus to a place of recognizing his real authority and the fullness of who he is. Fully man, fully God. That's a, big, that's a big statement for Paul to make. That's a powerful statement for Paul to make to help this church recognize not just that they, they are following Jesus, the king, but that he is the long-awaited king for history. One of the other things that he um, addresses here is in verses 21 and 22. And, and, he, and, and this, is, this is the part we always get excited about because this is kind of like the benefit of the good news for us, but it's that reconciliation has come. And that reconciliation being that the, the broken relationship between God and man has, has been brought back together, has been restored, right? Uh, but not just that, it's also the, the reconciliation that you now have access to with other people, right? Uh, because before that, you, there's no ability to restore relationships because it's, it's like an eye for an eye, right? Two for a two. And so um, the fact that reconciliation has come, that, that's a benefit of the good news. The fourth thing uh, that that really kind of leads us into is the statement in verse 27, where he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a little bit um, hinted at as well in verse 29, where he talks about, um, God working through him powerfully. There's a sense of that there's something beyond what Paul can do in his own ability that is happening, uh, but it's happening through him. And so, what is this? What is this? What is this all about? This this idea of Christ in you. Uh, this is the mystery that has now been revealed, and, and it's it. This is like a big snapshot back to the Old Testament with what Paul is doing here. To say that the promise to Abraham, you guys remember this in Genesis, was what? It was that God's people would be a blessing to the nations. Right? That was, that was God's design, his intent. That God's people would be a blessing. And the way that they lived, conducted themselves, like Kai, you're telling me the way they ate. Now, there would be there would actually be real benefits of knowing the people of Israel because of their worship of Yahweh, the one true God, right? And so um, this connection here is that Jesus now is fulfilling that promise, okay? Because the people of Israel failed to be the blessing that God had designed them to be, right? His intent for them to be the blessing did not happen. So Jesus is fulfilling that promise, and now he's extending that invitation to who? The Gentiles, which were, they were the outsiders, the foreigners. And so you want to talk about like this picture being made more whole and more complete. You see uh, Paul helping them realize that one, the mystery, 
The mystery that the Jewish people have longed for. The mystery of all time is being fulfilled in Jesus. Is that, and that it's Christ in you. People that are outside are now welcomed in to God's family. The second aspect of this that's really important is that God's presence is now with his people. Again, this goes back to the Old Testament, right? And you see, there's some powerful pictures of this. First of all, we see it in the garden, right? Where God and man are having a relationship together, right? There's an intimate relationship there that they are experiencing. We all know that because of the brokenness that ensued because of sin and rebellion, um, that, that relationship was broken and fractured, right? So you can't experience that relationship anymore. And so God, what does he do? Well, there's, we have time after time after time after time of him stepping in and being his presence to the people. One of those ways we see that is when he delivers them out of, the, out of slavery, right? From the land of Egypt. And he delivers them how? With his presence, right? And he, he governs them by night, by day, right? With his presence. Uh, okay, he tells them to build the tabernacle, right? The, 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 what ends up being the temple. And what fills the tabernacle or the temple? What makes it special is God's presence, right? And so, um, again, we have this picture of God's presence being with his people, and, and there's a lot of steps for them in order to be in his presence, to be and make themselves pure. And what Paul is saying here is that Christ is now in you. God's presence is now in you. You talk about an earth-shattering statement, an earth-shattering reality. The thing that the people had longed for, to be in God's presence, was now dwelling in them. It's because his spirit was in them. What does this mean for us today? Okay? So, because of this good news, everything is different. We no longer have to measure ourselves to culture standards and value. We can work for a purpose greater than ourselves, greater than our bank account, greater than our our status in society, because we can also love people not to earn something in return, right? Because of this good news, it frees us from those things. We can give generously because it all belongs to God in the first place. Um, and in 2 Thessalonians, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a statement that Paul makes that is really profound in thinking about this. He says, um, he called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you guys catch that? About glory? What did he say about glory? Share. We share in his glory. That's interesting. As God becomes more famous, as his reputation grows, we get to share in his glory. Paul, Paul kind of hints at this as well in Ephesians um, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he says, When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in Christ, there's that language, in Christ, in the King, you were marked with a seal. Oh, that's interesting. That's like king language, right? You want to be a part of the kingdom. You, there's a seal that would display that you're a part of that kingdom. What is that seal? Oh, the seal is the promised Holy Spirit. Verse 14 who is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. I think this is a powerful statement about what is happening when you come to place your faith in Jesus. Is that you get God's spirit in you um, and along with that, you get that seal, right? Um, and, and that gives God glory. Well, I think we'd all agree, the more people that come to know Jesus, the better, right? We long to see ch things change and transformed in our broken world. We know how, how that happened when people come to know Jesus, right? When Jesus is living in and through more and more people, that's, that's our hope as the church, right? It is that people would come to know Jesus. And, and that it would make God more glorified. It would make his name greater, right? He would become more famous, Another way of saying it. So Paul, he has an interesting way of talking about this. Look at verse 24. Paul says, he is suffering. Well, he's suffering for God's glory. Verse 25, Paul talks about his commission or his purpose. 
And his purpose is for God's glory. In verse 28, Paul talks about laboring, struggling. Again, for God's glory. Here's, here's a little, kind of like a little story that maybe help you think about this a little bit more. So I lived in South Africa for two years. Uh, I was actually an intern with, with crew, with Campus Crusade for Christ, after college. And as a young college graduate living overseas, uh, just trying to figure out life after college, um, you know, I, we were on campus all the time with students. Now, South Africa, just if you've never been, quick little overview of it. It's very diverse culturally. Um, it's not like just black people there. Uh, you got black and white people. I know that might be a mind blown thing, but South Africa has a rich, diverse um, heritage. Um, and part of that is because of where it was out in the trade route and in Europe and India. So I won't get into history lesson for you guys, but um, it has, um, so, so I don't look like, I don't, I wouldn't stand out by the way I look there. Um, but as soon as I started talking, just like in a lot of places, we do stand out as Americans, very much so. Now, um, being on a college campus and talking with college students every day, basically, there was an interest as soon as they found out you were American. Because believe it or not, um, a lot of people think if you're from America, you know Beyonce. <laughs> um, or that maybe you've met the president, um, or that maybe you're incredibly wealthy, which the reality is, is we are incredibly wealthy um, compared to a lot of the rest of the world. So I, I received recognition. Why? Because I'm an American. It's, it's interesting to think about, right? Um, I, I, there's parts of the United States that I really appreciate. There's parts that I, I, I would love to change, right? Um, but to people in other countries, um, so long as the reputation of the United States is positive or in good standing, people will look at the United States positively, right? So it's a good thing that when I was traveling, it was 2011, that was also the same time as the Arab Spring happened. If you know anything about the Arab Spring, that all took place in Northern Africa. So it's a really good thing that I was in Southern Africa and not in Northern Africa. Um, because I'm sure the perception of the United States was very different. <laughs> um, it, I shared in the glory of what the United States represented. It's an interesting picture to think about. Um, what this, this aspect of glory is all about. So in the same way, um, I think when we face disheartening times and challenges in life, um, it's, it's super important. This is why I really appreciate what, what Joanne shared. When we face difficult times in life, it's really easy to let, let whatever is happening, our circumstances, dictate the way we're going to feel about life. All right, so she, she mentioned how um, she's in her college room all day long, anxious. And despite being anxious, she chose to go to this invitation. I think that's a beautiful picture of what it looks like to live in Christ. So, Paul says this in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. One of the things I'm wrestling with that I think is just really important to grasp here when we think about glory uh, is, is we, we, we want to we want to further God's kingdom. We want people to experience the goodness of God. We want people to come to know how much he loves them, right? Um, and, and there's a beautiful thing that happens is, is that as that happens more and more, we get to experience that glory too, which is, is I think it's, that's a challenge for us to really fully understand what that looks like. I think there's glimpses of that. I think we get like a taste of that in positive ways. Um, 
But how does that work when, when things aren't happening well? Like when you're searching for a pastor for two years and you can't find a pastor. Like it, it's, it's difficult to like feel <laughs> that you're sharing in God's glory when maybe you're going, God, what are you doing? We've been praying, we've been asking, we've been looking for a pastor for two years and we haven't found anybody. I think there's other aspects of life where you feel like that too. Um, where you just go, man, God, I just feel like you're not there, right? Here's a few things to consider in closing. Um, these are a couple things that God just put on my heart this week that I really want to share with you guys and speak to you guys about. The pastor search, I know, has been difficult. There have been good prospects, um, and unfortunately, this has not been the right fit. And I would imagine many of you are disheartened. And it's easy for two things to start happening. One, I think you start wondering if the church is on a sinking ship. How long do I stick it out? What happens if it's another two years? Has God forgotten us? I think the other thing that starts happening is you start pointing fingers. It's so-and-so's fault that we are in this place. The committee is too picky. And I want to encourage you that each of you have a part to play here. I want you to search for a pastor for God's glory. I want you to pray for a pastor for God's glory. Don't let the search for a pastor take away from the opportunity you have to be Tahoe Community Church. Just because you don't have a pastor does not mean God doesn't have opportunities for you every day to represent him. When you're in the coffee shop, when you're buying groceries, when you're working in your yard, or you're hanging out at the beach or on the mountain, be the local church for God's glory. If you're a parent or a grandparent, uh, then I'm sure you also worry about the future of your kids and your grandkids. Whether it be the ever-changing culture or the future of this country, it can become consuming to worry about the future of the next generation. <laughs> I already do that. <laughs> Um, but it, it, honestly, it can become also wasteful to watch hours and hours of TV trying to know the secret to that change. Or which president needs to be elected, or what person you need to cancel. Because in Christ, you have the revealed secret of transformation. And that's living in you. It's God's spirit in you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So love and serve your family for God's glory. The last thing I think is really important to think about here is, is we all are shaped by images. There's a lot of images that we have seen throughout life that probably none of us can erase from our memory. It might be a crazy accident, it might be a trauma, um, it might be pornography that you've seen that it will not go away from your head. And the reality is that images are what are shaping us. Okay? You are being shaped, and this is what the Jesus uses the terminology of discipleship. You're being discipled, shaped by something. So what's shaping you? What are your thoughts and your emotions focusing on? This is, this is important because this is what Paul is doing for that church. He says, I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Right? I don't want you to be shaped by what culture is telling you, what these other Jewish people are, are forcing you. Do not be shaped by those things. Be shaped by Jesus. And he says this in, in, in or the, I should say, the letter of Hebrews says this really well, where it says, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And for the joy set out for him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame. That's a, that's a beautiful statement right there. Despite the shame that all the cross brought, he had joy. And he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. There it is. There's that royal language. He is enthroned. Think of him, verse 3, who endured such opposition against himself by sinners. Why? So that you may not grow weary in your souls and give up. The last, last part of this message I just want to close with is actually praying the beginning of Colossians for you guys as a church. It's verses 9 to 14. Um, but I just want to pray because I think that is 
uh, what God has beautifully shown us in this letter is that Paul, who's never met this church, writes this letter to encourage them to fix their eyes on Jesus because Christ is in them, the hope of glory, right? And, and, and one of those ways he does that is he begins his letter, he does it in a few letters, and, he, and this letter is, is one of those, is where he, he begins by telling them how he prays for them. If you ever want to figure out how to pray, if you struggle in prayer, figuring out what that looks like, I think this is a great model of what that looks like. So if you just pray with me. Heavenly Father, may Tahoe Community Church be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of you, Lord, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to your glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to you, our Father, who has qualified them to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You have delivered us all from the domain, the kingdom of darkness, and you've transferred us to your kingdom, the kingdom of your beloved Son, Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Most of us remember Mondo. They used to be here, and uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful pastor, wonderful pastor of this church. And uh, I don't remember it being more full when Mondo was here. As I look around, I see that Jesus has remained the pastor of this church, and he is blessing us eternally. And uh, that he's the only one we need. He's the only one we need. Praise God. We're going to sing just a course of walk with you.